Dame Jules and Dame Linda Top. Welcome to Between Two Beers. Thanks very yeah, much. Very exciting to be here. Yeah. Yeah. We, we are very excited to have you in the Export Beer Garden Studio. We got the heads up that you guys might enjoy having a beer. And uh, yeah, I yeah. see. I'm going to open up mine now, too, you yeah. know. Um, I've got a low carb. I'm going for low carb. Very good. Um, and um, and that's you know that's great because it's a little it's a little more healthy. Yeah. We like healthy. We're moving into healthy. And and Jules, what are you going with? I'm just going to go with zero. She's going with a zero. Yeah. Love Very it. Good. Yeah. And that's get... the range. Yeah. yeah. Is, is that it? No, we've got oh. the, old, the classic export gold is in there as well. Oh, okay. Here we go. The, Hang uh, on. We'll get shit faced later on. <laughs> <laughs> when we started this podcast four years ago as a little grassroots football show, there's You're killing lots of the directions. open, Steve. You're killing the open. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Anticipation here. Okay, here we go. Yeah, please. Oh, oh, there you go. A little bit of, spa- little bit of spill. Yeah, a little yeah. bit of froth, froth, frothy one. How <laughs> good. Oh, what I was going to say is there's lots of directions that I could envisage our show going. Having the beer, getting on the piss with the top twins. <laughs> yeah. I didn't see it coming. This is amazing. This is a real moment for us. So thank you so much for we giving like us We like beer and rugby. There you yeah. go. Yeah. yeah. Fit right in. Yeah. Um, the new book, Untouchable Girls, is out today. Mm-hmm. I've read it. Amazing. Like such a great representation and great storytelling. Of, New Zealanders of, love reading things about other New Zealanders. We've yeah. realised that New Zealand actually has this wonderful um, ability to now love what Kiwiism is. Before we didn't. You know, the powers that be on TV, they, they wouldn't back any New Zealand comedy shows because they said it was a bit cringy. They thought New Zealand comedy was not up to standard for the rest from the rest of the world. But now that's completely changed. We're, everything Kiwi is cool now. Mm. And I think, you know, all the even like things that you, you guys are doing here, this is so Kiwi. Oh, and so you. it just catches on. It's, awesome. There's something really good about understanding your own culture. And, and 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 people get to talk in a way they feel like they uh, can open up without feeling not they're going to get attacked. Yes. Oh. Yeah, that's the most important thing. Amazing. Yeah. And that, that is what we do. We, we create a space. And the, it's important to um, admire and appreciate Kiwi icons, but also yeah. the ability to tell good stories, which is all yeah. through the book. And there's two things that struck me from reading the book. The first thing is that you guys have done a lot, eh? There's a lot yeah. in there, like you, the yeah. breadth and scope yeah, of your lives. Yeah, we've been busy. We've been busy <laughs> since 1958. I didn't realise you were lesbians. You didn't realise. <laughs> <laughs> Where have you been, eh? No, of course come I from did. from Hamilton. Of course <laughs> I did. <laughs> you were the only gay icons that I had growing up on TV. Okay. I didn't well, that was my reference point. I didn't realise that you guys had beards. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a new one to me. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking they'll, they'll be clean shaven. No, 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 no. They've got the big beard going on, haven't yeah, they? Two beards. Yeah, Linda's yeah. got a beard. She keeps it quite nice. <laughs> every day and then. It's a lesbian thing. <laughs> the, the, the second thing that struck me about uh, The Untouchable Girls is you can't actually read it or talk about it with having, without having The Untouchable Girls song in your head for three days oh, yeah. either side. Yeah. How does yeah. it go? Just, Untouchable, untouchable, untouchable girls. We're untouchable, untouchable, untouchable girls. Just, just on repeat. Love the harmony, boys. Love the harmony. Just on repeat, like all morning. I know what 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 you've created now is when people read the book, they're going to start singing that song in their heads. A hundred percent. You look. Eventually, you have to let that song go for a little bit. You're going to hate us otherwise. Just, just so you can read the book, and you know. It's exciting to have a book out there, and we know that you know. Hopefully, lots of people are going to read the book. But it was really interesting writing a book because, you know, we we we've always you know seen ourselves as entertainers. We're 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 live. We we like to walk out on the boards and and do a show, and you get immediate feedback from that. But when you write a book, you know, you're at home on your own or whatever, or we were working together sometimes, and as a, a year later. Then a book arrives in your mailbox. You think there it is, you know. And then you don't know who's buying the book or where they're going to read it. Are they reading it on the bus? Are they reading it at home? Are they in the bath? You know, where are they reading that book? And but they have that moment, the the reader. We never get to see their response. The only thing that we get to see is how many books are sold. I yes. think it's a perfect place to read the book would be in bed. In bed. Yeah. In bed with the top twins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Brilliant. a few people over the years that would have dreamt of that, opp- yeah. <laughs> of that, of that opportunity. <laughs> T- tell me, was were there some discrepancies in your retelling of the same story between no, the two of you? No, because we set up a really different way of writing a book from anyone else ever because usually there's only one writer, mm. not two. 
we had to find a way so we didn't get into each other's way. Linda was really cool. She's on the computer quite a lot. She did a timeline for us. It started when we were born in 1958, right through until 2022. And we'd wake up every morning and we'd talk to each other on the phone. And I'd say, I think I'm going to go and do today 1971. Oh, wow. And she'd say, I think I'm going to do 1976 or 1981 or whatever. And yeah. so in that timeline that she'd written were the most important things that happened in that year and things that she thought or felt that were important that had happened in our lives. So it was we set it up already so that when we wanted someone to read a book, they felt that it was just a flowing book. Mm. You didn't have to say, well, who the hell's writing that? You see, we didn't want it to be a stop and start it. Jules said this, Linda said that. So now it's a book. It feels like it flows. Yeah, it You does. can just sit down and read yeah. it. We've had people that have just read it in a day. Yeah, yeah. They just said I, really they couldn't read. put it down. They yeah. couldn't put it down. They wanted to know what's happening next. It was too heavy. They had to rest it <laughs> on something. I'm going to put this book down. Yeah. Did you have a feeling of, because we often get people that tell their whole life stories on here, and at the end they find it quite therapeutic in a way that you don't often sit down and reflect on everything you've done. Like when you got to the end of the book, and I don't know if you've gone and re uh, uh, read it since but do you have that feeling of no of satisfaction? we haven't read it once we do something we move on it's you never go back never go back we 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 wrote it we know what we what we wrote um i mean we flicked through it when it when we when it arrived it's quite exciting when a book arrives mm. you think ah oh, here it is it's a actually book. in my hands yeah and we looked at all the pictures <laughs> that's the first and thing you do when you yeah, get a new book yeah, isn't it right. you look through and, the pictures and that was very mm. important how the book looked to us because we wanted the pictures through the book I hate those books where there's writing all the way through and in the middle mm. are all the pictures. Yeah. And they're not they don't have any correlation yeah. to the story you know, that's happening yeah. right and next to them. Yeah. And you've got to go back and think, oh yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah that's right. Yeah. That's so we we, part, well, yes. we we're, we're a bit sort of, you know, you know, prick, picky about that. But we also have lived a long time and been through m- many different things in our lives. So we we already know what we've done and we know how important those things that we did way back, all those protest years, all those major things that happened in New Zealand. Something political was happening every five years without fail, and they were major. Nuclear free, spring box tour, um, Bastion Point, uh, homosexual law reform bill, all those things that meant a lot to us. We had to stand up, and what what was different about us is that when we stood up, we had a guitar in our hand, and we sang a song about it. And we became, a lot of those songs became a, a catch cry for those those important political moments. You, you're sort of underselling it. Like you, you've done so much, it's it's going to be hard to cover it all in the book. But it's actually quite a nice seg to where we want to start. So, the way we do things here is we canvas friends and colleagues and people that know you well to get their impressions of you. And we, for you, we went to Chris Parker, who we had on as a, a guest on the show. Yeah, incredibly talented. Yep, energetic, uh, engaging Chris Parker. So we asked him about the top twins, and this is what he said. He said, the top twins are and will continue to be my greatest source of inspiration as a comedian in Aotearoa. They have laid down an extremely vibrant, camp, gay old path for performers like me to follow down. They'll never fully appreciate how much easier they've made it for performers like me to thrive in this country. But I do truly owe so much of what I am able to do with my career to them. Like incredibly nice words from Chris. But yeah. the question, the follow-up question is, do, do you know how much you mean to people like Chris? Right, well, in, in, in all honesty, that's what people are supposed to do. They leave a legacy. So the door is open. You know, we've always done that. We've had that, we had this saying, you know, um, if you open the door, make sure you keep your foot in it to let somebody else through. You know, and if you can do that, uh, it's an amazing feeling that you can help, you know, the next lot, lot come through the door. And I suppose in some ways, you know, for us it was... You know, being openly lesbian, you know, in 1970, early 1970s, where a lot of the media wouldn't print the word. Some media outlets were not allowed to print the word lesbian yeah. in their newspapers. And so, um, and then the following year, apparently, um, they were allowed slither. to, and then everything was lesbian in every newspaper, everywhere we went. In fact, the first year that we went to Wellington, they weren't allowed to print the word lesbian. So they called us. Men hating Mickey Takers. <laughs> <laughs> Which was a long way away from the truth. Yeah. It was really weird, you know. Yeah, because they had this concept that if you're a lesbian... That you hate men. you yeah. hate men. And we're going, no, we don't hate men. You know, we've got a dad, we've got a brother, you know. We like rugby. Yeah. Um, you know, we like to have a beer and sit down with a few blokes and stuff like that, you know. Um, 
uh, early on in our lives, you know, we went hunting and we I'm, I'm a fisherwoman and, and all that kind of stuff. So we like sitting down with having a yarn with people and stuff like that. So, um, but, you know, ha- that's how, um, you know, things change in media where, okay, we can't print the word lesbian, so how do we explain what a lesbian is? Mm. And because we were funny and we were, you know, sometimes sending things up rather than putting things down, and the difference between sending things up and putting things down is if you put something down, you don't have to know anything about it. You can just rubbish it. But if you're sending something up, you have to know everything about it. And that's the difference. That was the difference of our political statements and our comedy and all that kind of stuff. So when Ken and Ken, you know, when we established Ken and Ken, we were not putting anybody down. We were sending things up. But we also, what happened with Ken and Ken was blokes like Ken and Ken out there thought that it was a tribute to them. Yeah. <laughs> That's how positive comedy can be, yeah. you know. That, that, you know, the best one was when we did the, the um, we got invited to a show down in Invercargill um, for My My of the Year. And, you know, My My of the Year in Invercargill, that's a big weekend, you know. You're all waiting, we're counting down, you know, the days for duck shooting yeah. season to you start. Know, only four sleeps to go and all that kind of stuff. So just pause here, that's such a Kiwi thing. You talked at the top of the, the episode about Kiwi celebrating Kiwis. I'm not sure you can come up with a more Kiwi thing yeah. than My My of the Year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so Ken and Ken arrived, you know, to, and it was a men's only night. They 400 had, men. Yeah, yeah, and they had... Um, I can that, just see the meeting now. Who are we going to get Who we're going to get to do the entertainment for the blokes? I go, uh, I'll get the, uh, you know, the lesbians that dress up as men. We'll yeah. get them. Get the lesbians <laughs> down from Auckland. And, uh, and then, so what happened? We arrive in Invercargill, which at the big hotel there yeah. as you come into town. The tables, big, big trestle tables with silage wrap on them. No tablecloths, silage wrap. Uh, there were two, uh, there was a meal. There were two pies, <laughs> potato, peas, and gravy, yeah. and two long, long neck bottles of beer. Yeah. And, and it was like men heaven, a night yeah. out yeah. called Sorry. men heaven. Yeah. That's the most. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I thought, I thought it was so, just an event. I didn't realise the detail that yes. went into the event. So, but yeah. wait, there's more. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, um, so it was just an amazing night. And we, because we are rural and we've come from you know, a background of, you know, farming communities and everything. We knew everything about Ken. We, you know, we grew up with, you know, old blokes that used to come down, you know, to, to the farm, they'd call in and see dad or mum or whatever and stuff like that. And, and they, they were the sort of guys that, you know, when mum came out to say hello, they'd take their head off. So, you know, Mrs. Top. You know, and then they respectful. Yeah, and all that kind of stuff. And mum then would head back inside and make a batch of scones and a cup of tea, you know. So we grew up in a farming community like that. And so it was easy for us in some ways to take that into where we went with our entertainment, you know, and, and making things funny makes people come on board. When you're speaking like that as Ken and Ken at one of these events, are you, like, scripting what you're going to say? No, Do you just go no, with a bit of an idea? never scripted anything in our entire life. The only thing right we've idea. ever written down is the new book. Yeah. <laughs> True story? True story? Yeah. True story. Amazing. So we have an idea of what you're going to do with the character? Or Sometimes you just get we up don't. We just get up there and then we're in front of them and then what? something something always comes. Uh, only because, the only reason it will work is because there has to be um, a kindness to your comedy. Because if you put something down, it means you're, you've got to make someone look bad to get a laugh. Right? And that's a cheap laugh. Things we didn't like about that. We'd seen that and you know, when we were overseas and there was lots of big uh, comedy festivals that we went to and, and there was a lot of, uh, you know, putting someone down to get a laugh and it just didn't feel right for us. So what happens is that when you have a kindness to get a laugh, what you're doing is you're, you're lifting somebody up, not putting somebody down. And then what happens is we started this whole idea that we had this thing that we just felt was always in our hearts and that was amuse but never abuse. And so in some ways, New Zealand came with us because they, they, although they knew we were, you know, alternative, you know, weirdos, and some <laughs> of them thought we were, uh, they knew that we were speaking the truth mm. and they couldn't, they couldn't fight that. You know what I mean? There were, there were blokes out there that were that, uh, like our dad, who would have given the shirt off their back and be so helpful. 
and we knew that those people existed. So we wanted to make Ken and Ken the kind of guys that would give the shirt off their back. Yeah. Not that we ever took our shirts off because <laughs> then you would have exposed <laughs> Ken's breast, <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> and then everybody would have known. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> camp you, mother would have been outed. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're so right about the vibes you give off. Yeah, it's it's all uplifting stuff. But that must, despite how experienced you were, uh, when you're going to MC or speak at a thing with no prep, is there, are there nerves still? Like. Towards the, I the think latter that, part you know, of your career? There, we, there was always a, a, a moment before we went on, and we used to have this little ritual where we'd stand together and look at each other. We'd put one person put their hand out, and then the other person put their hand on top of that hand until both of our hands were all laid out. And then we'd go one, two, three, and throw our hands in the air, and then we'd walk on. And that was this nervous, there was a nervousness in, in, the, in our energy. But then what that does, what happens when you walk onto that stage, that nervous energy becomes your performance, you know. So you, you, you need that you kind of need that energy yeah. to go out and try and do something without a script. Yeah. There were some people who you could say, I want you to go on stage. Uh, this is what it's about. Um, there's no <laughs> script. Just get out there and do it. And they go, what? <laughs> they'd be panicking. Oh, they'd be yeah. thinking, no way, I'm not going to do that. But the, where, if someone gave us a script, we said, we can't do that because now we're just reading something. There's no emotion in it. There's no, nothing to react to. Mm. I can we're remember not there was a, a moment um, when um, Billy T. James, years ago, bless his heart, he, he, would, he, he would walk out without a script. And, um, and he was working with a, quite a famous New Zealand actress. And um, they were going to do something together. And he, she said, well, you know, what's the script? I'll see out there. He said, well, just, we'll just do it when we get out there. Well, she was panicking. She's old-time script, da-da-da, he's just walking out. And then she said, I don't think I can do it. And he said, look, all you've got to remember is you need a good start, a good middle, and a great finish. <laughs> <laughs> just go and do it. That's all you need. That's it. Simple as. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if you guys underrate how special that ability is. Yeah. Like you say, some people, like 99% of people would absolutely shit their... I know I would get yeah. up there and without, without a script. You have. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> but to be able they to... Did a, they did a survey in America years and years and years ago as to ask people what was the scariest thing that could happen to them. A death came in second. And yeah. public speaking came in Is that first. Right? Yeah. yeah, it was the scariest yeah. thing that they could think of doing wow. to be able to stand to have to stand up in front of a crowd without us without anything in front of you, mm. and talk. But you and me, and you and me, and me and her, and anyone in this room, we can have a conversation. We don't carry a script with us. No. When we talk to somebody, it's called communicating. It's what you do. You you look someone squarely in the eye and you talk to them. Mm. And if you do that to an audience, they go, "Wow, someone's talking to me." I mean, there's, there is communicating, but there's also being in character and communicating in a completely different context, which is an incredible skill that you both... Well, what well, it's both easier have. in a character. Yeah. You're hiding behind something. You're sort of, it's you not know, you that has to talk. It's something and, else that and comes out of you. What <laughs> happened was that we, we honed those characters to the point where they all had a, a history, where they were born, mm. you know, what school they went to, all that. that we, we gave them all of that. So we knew, it, knew those yeah. characters really brilliant. So one time we went in to find a suit for Linda in an old second-hand shop, <laughs> and it was an old, some old beige. My suit. beige, my jacket, yeah, you know, because Ken knows and he only wears beige. Yeah. yeah. He wore a, a sort of a dark purpley suit. I had a purpley time. suit there because I couldn't find a beige one for okay. a long time there. Anyway, a beige one it was, and anyway, we so get it home, and Linda reaches into the inside pocket, and there was an old brown one dollar, dollar one dollar note. Yeah. You know the we old went, brown ones, yeah. really yeah. old. You know. And we said, "You have a dead man's suit." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've got a dead man's jacket. Yeah, so we called it the dead man's jacket. And, and you know what? I we, that that I bought that jacket probably twenty five years ago. And the dollar is still in the pocket. Is that? Good Don't luck. Yeah. Hold it up. And Don't take the dollar out of the. Oh, you find time. an old dollar yeah, in yeah. your pocket. Yeah, that's part of your history. That's part of your history yeah. as a character. And so Ken's the kind of bloke that. And he goes, somebody says, oh, have you got, any, you got a couple of bucks, Ken? You know, and I'll, I'll pat my, you know, my thing down and stuff like that. And I, I used to do this thing where I'd pat the sides of my pocket to see if there's anything. And then I'd pat my top pocket and I'd go, and I'd go oh, <laughs> Ken, I've got breast. I didn't realise. <laughs> and, and, then, and then I'd reach in and pull out my money. And it was a, and a, you know, it was a non-usable brown $1 note, you know, that don't exist anymore. 
But that was Ken. That, but was, that was the greatest moment in busking history when we got dollar one dollar coins and two dollar coins <laughs> because we made a shitload of money on Friday night in Queen Street. Well, yeah. amazing segue because I wanted to ask: Was that the foundation for everything that you do now? Is those Pretty six much. years busking on? We were desperate to earn money, so we had to get out of the car and make people put their hands in their pockets, pull out some money, put it, come over, put it in our guitar case. You know, these people hadn't bought a ticket to a show. They were just wandering along Queen Street, and Bobby had to work really hard to make them stop in front of us, and 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 get them to do something. We honed so our skills, you know, on, on the, the on the streets, mm. and 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 I think you know, and the <laughs> the first time we came into town, we were living out in the bush, and um, out towards Bethel's Beach, and out we'd lived out at Huia as well, and we were you know we were really living in the bush, you know, we were cooking off on and up. We'd dragged an old coal range out there, and we were lighting fire, and we'd cook out there, and we. We slept under the bloody stars and all sorts of things. Did we you were, really? Yep. Yeah. We're you know we're country kids. Country we've always <coughs> we've always been we've loved the land and we've loved you know being in that environment. And for a, a quite a long time in our early sort of you know sort of nineteen to twenty five year old selves, we were out in, in Bethels and Huia, and um and we had a beaten up old you know station wagon and we had dogs about five or six dogs you know and and um. We, you know, we'd come into town and we'd wear our gum boots and, you know, we had our old check shirts on and stuff like that. And we came into town, we had enough money to buy some groceries and some petrol and, and a box of beer. And then we'd go to the glue pot downstairs because we didn't know upstairs existed at that time, where all the music was. We'd, we'd drink downstairs in the glue pot. And... Um, we had we'd gone in there sort of late in the afternoon for a beer, and then we realised when we came out that we actually didn't have enough money left <laughs> to fill the car up <laughs> to get back home out to out to. We the had the bush. guitar in the back though. We so said, we Let's go down. So down we drove Queen down Street. to Queen Street and parked on the side there. You could you, where you you know years ago when you used to be able to park in Queen Street, mm. yeah. you go down and we pulled in and then we got our guitar out and went in front of the bank there, the National Bank that was closed you know on Fridays, and we started the singing. Theater, you know, you know, we started singing, playing the guitar. And I think we made $150 the first night because wow. we just were, were, you know, we just got out. We were being outrageous and yelling and screaming and, you know, and stuff like that. The only people that could ever shut us down were the Hare Krishnas. I wondered about and that because they they're still along. knocking around now. Yeah, yeah. Probably, yeah. And they would come. You could hear them, you know, with their little cymbals and their, tank, <laughs> their calabashes. Or no, not calabashes. What are they called? Cymb- Symbols, symbols, yeah, yeah, symbols, yeah. <laughs> symbols, and their little dingy things and stuff like that, and they'd all come Hare Hare Krishna. That's all they ever said. The lyrics were, you know, they never got past those lyrics. Did they? <laughs> but anyway, we just happen, we'd just come in behind them. They'd they come would, down the street and we'd just join with them and head off yeah. down the street with them. Everyone thought it was they'd funny. Sounding off, and then we'd be behind them, and we'd go probably another four hundred meters down, and everybody's watching, you know, us and they singing Hare, yeah. <laughs> and then we'd peel off and come back and. It was funny, you know, what we were doing was funny and it was out there and everything like that. And then after that night, we thought, we can make money. We can make money busking. And so every Friday, pretty much for a year and a half, we would come in and do our busking stint. And then until we, got, that a, until we got arrested. Final, the final night where we got yeah. arrested. Mm. Um, I'm going to get to the arresting story soon. Was there, did you have like a greatest hits? Like was there a certain song or a couple of songs that would draw in a crowd or be? Untouchable Girls was an early, was a learning song that, you know, just every, it was a, just a catch cry, wasn't it, for yeah. us? We were Untouchable and, and, Girls. And because we always wrote songs about, you know, what was happening in that at time in our life, um, there was a great song that I remember now called Outlaws in the Bush. We wrote a song called Outlaws in the Bush. I ain't a going to pay no taxes. We ain't a going to pay no rent. Cause living in the city, you're gonna end up bent. Oh, we're outlaws in the bush, and so we, we would just break out with that song, and people were going, what, "Who are these people? What are they doing on the street?" You know, and we had our gumboots on, and yeah. it was it was different. And there was many, you know, there was all sorts of stuff happening. Bastion Point, we wrote a song about Bastion Point that became sort of you know a national anthem for the you know the the, the, the fight the up there. We would fundraise yeah. at the. I can remember the last time we were up at Bastion Point, <coughs> Jules and I had said, we're ready to get arrested today. We're going to go, we're going to stand our ground and we'll be arrested if we have to be. Anyway, so the police had come, you know, were the police, not, were not all, most of the time there were some police there. But we lined ourselves up with everybody who was prepared to, you know, take them on. And then there was this booming voice, you know, behind us. 
saying, you 20s, get out of that line, please. I'm going, oh, what's going on there? Stuff like that. We think maybe we're in the wrong place or something. But no, they said, get out of there, please. We're going to need you to sing down at the glue pot for the fundraiser who, for all the people who are going to get arrested. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we, we, knew, we knew when and how to deal with different protests. Bastion Point was not our protest. Bastion Point was for the people who owned that land. And that, it was young people who needed to stand up and fight their fight. Yeah. And so we, we were there to help. Our job was, help, how can we help? What do you need us to do? Because it's all about self-governing. And when someone comes along and says, um, you know, I'm, this is what I'm going to do, you might not be helping. You need to listen to what people need from you. And so we, we would listen. We would just say, what do you guys need us to do? And they said, we need you to raise money for people who are going to get arrested. Because these the people who are going to get arrested are the ones who want to get arrested because they need to know how strongly they feel about this. And so we went, okay, that's fine. We'll help raise the money. It's important that we knew our place in that and we knew it, uh, it's a job that we could do yeah. and, and it really helped. So we never it, ever yeah. really were any part of the organising teams of any of those marches. Um, there was, you know, the nuclear free, the... Reclaim the Night, um, the Homosexual Law Reform Bill. We never were part of the management team of organising those rallies, but they asked us to sing at the end of all of those marches or at the rallies. And then what happened is that we became, you know, very visual in those protests because we were always asked to perform. And, you know, we had a mic. We had a mic each. So we not only could we sing to them, but we could actually give them a message, make it positive as well as, you know, entertaining them. So, you know, we, we, were, we felt lucky. And it was just the times know? that we were living in then. Yeah. People were really political. It's changed. There's a lot of different kind of ways of being political now. And people are, you know, if we were going to say anything important and positive to young people, it's to stand up and say what you feel. Don't hold back. Don't go on to, uh, you know, Twitter social or text, you know, or Facebook or yeah, whatever. Yeah, don't do that. But actually TikTok. stand up and what speak. What is TikTok? TikTok? TikTok. That's a clock to me. Yeah. <laughs> In some ways, you know, we've, we're, 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 our, our young people are lonely. They, they, can, they can protest in their bedroom on their phone. But they need, you need a support. You need a group of people who are willing to support you. They have different issues that we don't... We, if someone came up to us when we were 15 years of age and said, what do you think about climate change? We'd go, what are you talking about? At 16 years old, we'd never heard those two words together. You know, we knew that the climate was changing a bit because we'd sometimes make hay in December and then suddenly we were making hay in January. So our whole system had gone out of whack as far as farming was concerned. So there was talk about it then that, wow, we didn't get the hay done in December. And so I think farmers have been asking a question about that a long time. We just didn't do anything about it. Mm. But now we've got young kids. I, know, I have a friend whose kid is on anxiety tablets because they're scared of the weather. Yeah, you know, they don't know they, when that big cyclone like that. came. It was the first time they'd ever been in a cyclone. They're absolutely panicked that they're all going to die and when they're going to drown and the world might disappear. We never had that worry as a young kid. Hey. The only way, if it flooded out at our place, we go, "Where's our togs?" Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know just, let's go down the swamp. Yeah, we might be able to catch the meals and everything. You know, we've, we've we've barely scratched the surface. Like the, the activism is such an important theme throughout your lives and careers. Looking back on it. Are you filled with pride about always being on the right side yes. of history? Yes, you know, we are. Like, you never winning. lost a fight, did you? We never no. lost a fight. We yeah. won everything. When we when we stood know? up and fought for the you know when when the Springboks tour was on, it was no oh, we had no idea, our idea in our mind that we would that Nelson Mandela would be freed and become the leader of his country, a man who'd been in prison for like thirty five years, you know, thrown away the key, and when we and and when we stood up, we we knew that rugby was playing second fiddle to a, more, a much more important role where we would say a, a, a young black man or a young black woman should be able to go into the hotel in the same door as a white person. And even when our, when our rugby team played there, our Maori players had to go in the back door. And we said, this, this, this wouldn't happen in New Zealand. It's unacceptable in New Zealand. It has to be unacceptable in South Africa. So we, we made a stand. And, and we, we love rugby. Yeah. And people were saying, you're anti-rugby and all that sort of stuff. And we said, well, no, we're not. We're, we're for this equality that needs to happen. And our mum had said to us when we were little, you should never hate anybody. 
and it was a beautiful. I mean, when we're seven, it sort of went right over the top of our heads. Yeah. <laughs> but when Mum's gives you that sort of idea, she said you can dislike somebody, but but she said if you hate something, it'll hurt you more than it'll hurt the other person. And she was just an amazing person, and still al- she's alive now. She's ninety three, you know, and she's amazing. And she taught us all this stuff. And so she taught us some empathy to stand in someone else's shoes and see how they feel. Yeah. And so it wasn't hard for us to make those decisions. It, and it doesn't seem hard now. Like it seems like such an easy thing that you're fighting for. But at the time, it yeah. was a real statement to be made. When the, there, yeah. were, there were 300 people that they reckon that got onto the field in Hamilton. And Jules and I were number, you know, 298 and 299. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was a moment that I always look back on and think, we made it. We, we did the hard yards. We were part of a group called the Pasu Squad who were the ones who have appeared to get arrested and to also do actions. And so um, that mob of people, when, when, I write the, when we were writing the story in the book, I said, this is not my, just my story. Those 300 people that were on the field with us, that's their story as well, you know. And so, um, you know, we, we've done a lot, it, it seems, at, at, you know, to change things in New Zealand. But it wasn't just us. No. It was everybody's story in that time who were part of the those community. That but, yeah. that but just together. zeroing in on that, how many times have you been arrested? Uh, probably about maybe six or seven times been arrested. Six or seven? I think so. Uh, spring box. We were arrested probably over the spring box. We were arrested um, about three times. Street. Yeah, we teased, it, we teased yeah. it earlier. We need the story. Uh, why did you get arrested for busking on the street? Because uh, what happened was crowd that got too big. Crowd got too big, and then <laughs> I um, hate it when that happens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the cops arrived Sorry. and parked four cars. The young a young constable arrived and he tried to shut us down. You still and remember the, his name, don't you? Yeah. And the crowd got angry. Crowd got angry, and started throwing all the money they were going to put in a case at him. They started throwing uh, money at the cop, and he mm. got freaked out. I think, and so he called for backup. You know, you're saying, oh, there's some lesbians and a dog and a guitar and people here. I need backup. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then four cars turned up, four police cars, and parked on Queen Street, all with their lights flashing and everything. And then buses had to go around them. So then other cars were, you know, stopping and everything. And people across the road saying, what's happening over there? So more people came. It just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And then eventually they said, okay, we're arresting you. Get in the car. So we, they took us to a police car. Jules yelled out to a friend of ours. They wouldn't let us take our guitar and they wouldn't let us take our dog. Yeah. Mm. And so that, that really hurt. Yeah, yeah, that was terrible. I didn't mind about getting arrested, but it was uncool that they wouldn't let us take the dog and the guitar. Very uncool. They, our yep. friend saved the dog and the guitar and then we got taken in the car. And when they thought we thought they're going to drop us off around the corner. But no, they didn't. They took us all the way to the police station. And we, we got released at about four o'clock the following morning. Jules and I had sung in the prison cells. We sang, we made up all these sort of blues songs. <laughs> I've been here for 25 years. <laughs> We're doing all this weird stuff. And I think in the end, the Watchtower people are saying, for God's sake, get those kids <laughs> just out get, of here. Just get them I'm out. I'm sick of those you know, blues songs. But Anyways, you, and then the following morning, we had to go to, to um, court, court. Yeah, so this kind of put you on the map, right? Like, yeah, it was $10,000 worth of publicity. Ten, Bring it yeah. on. Yeah, we <laughs> should have sent a thank you letter to the police. <laughs> was it the news and then the court yeah. and the trial that happened afterwards? Yeah, it was like, weird. Was that kind of the making of the Top Twins? Well, it wasn't the making of the Top Twins, but it was a bloody good story. Yeah. And, <laughs> um, and it was great because mum and dad were at home. They were watching the late night news as normal. You know, those, our parents always watch the news without bloody ever questioning it. And there's Angela the Ordinary. We called her Angela the Ordinary. <laughs> and the Ordinary. Uh, but anyway, um, at the, there's a note that comes in across their desk. Oh, and on they, camera. On camera. Yeah, on camera. Oh, and she said, uh, breaking news, just a hand. Just a the hand. The top twins have been arrested in Queen Street. That was it. And then the weather Ma- came on. Yeah. And <laughs> mum and dad could, oh my God, what have they done now? You know, it was pretty wild. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I guess in some ways the ridiculous thing was that we were arrested for cheering everyone up. That was kind of weird. Yeah. That we were down just singing and having a nice time with everyone. It was a moment where... Um, the publicity just kicked in. Everybody thought, it's, well, this is a story. So we're on the front page of the then, what was it, the Star Dalton or something? Star, yeah. yeah. And then there was media everywhere about it. We had been on the TV, uh, radio. even made the New York, New York Times yeah, to really. say that if New you York busk Times. in New Zealand, you get arrested. Yeah. <laughs> and then, um, Everyone and Jules, oh, I don't want to go there. Yeah. <laughs> and then Jules and I, as ch- children, had watched religiously Perry Mason and Ironside. Um, you know, those, you know, crime sort of, you know, courtroom areas. And so 
we said, let's defend ourselves. And what happened was that um, the, the police had got six witnesses. They had a big case. And um, they brought in a woman from the council who started spouting the bylaws about busking and everything. We'd been, we'd been charged with a criminal offence of obstructing the pavement. Yeah, obstructing it the wasn't a, It wasn't a civil case that could be brought, brought yeah. against us by the council. And so but I stood up and said, excuse me, Your Honour, but I'd just like to bring to your attention that we've been charged with a criminal offence, not a civil offence. So all the um, evidence uh, from the witness is inadmissible in this case. And wow. he said, well, yes, I'm afraid I'm going to have to agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> we like, I can't believe that word. <laughs> and that must have got out somehow because within an hour, the entire faculty, faculty from the law school at the University, Auckland of University, were in the courtroom. They'd all trudged down from the... To watch it. They said, we've got to go down to the court case. Which legend grows. And then, yeah. and, then yeah. they, and then we were saying things and we just, you know, said a few things that were quite funny and everything like that. And then people started laughing in the court and all that kind of stuff. And then, um, then the, you know, the judge had to make a thing saying, you know, well, he banged his little gavel. Is that called a gavel, I think? Gravel. And said that, um, you know, we'll have to keep everybody, you know, keep the noise down, you know, in the courtroom because I'll have to, you know ask you to be removed and all this sort of stuff and it was just weird in some ways but then then they he made a judgment that from now on from that day on if Jules and I were going to go busking we had to ring the police station and let them know where we were going to be and what time and they would assign two young constables to come down to be crowd control <laughs> <laughs> It still yes. stands today. Yeah. So but in you never went busking. We never went back. No. The sponta- Didn't appeal to you. Yeah. Spontaneous was, was you- gone. No spontaneity. Do you reckon you could pick up the phone today and go, hey, by the way, guys, we're thinking about going down to Queen Street and yeah. you get two constables You today? know what? That's that's probably, you know, we've we've been rebels all our lives a little bit, so we probably wouldn't ring up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah we right. just wait for them to arrive. Yeah, we'll just go down there and play. Yeah. So good. It'd be, it'd be a U2 <laughs> moment. Woohoo! That all, you know, we, we, we might we maybe do it up on the rooftop or something and stop all the traffic and... Yeah. Think, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. It's, and what was really good about that is we were already moving away from the streets and going into a, the theatre. Yeah. So it just, it just, it just kind of was a, a, a beautiful change that we we started touring New Zealand and suddenly we had a career. That busking street stuff is so interactive, like all of your stuff does. Did you ever get neg? Did you ever get heckled? Did you no. ever get people sort no. of? There were some beautiful moments on the street. There's one in the book where um, this guy is just charging down the the right. He's just running flat out. He's like 100 miles an hour. And he runs right through uh, us past the guitar. The crowd sort of had to move. He just goes straight through, right? And then about maybe. But four, as he's going through, four he's got or five a bag. minutes he's got later, a, he's got, got a big bag, bag and he and drops he it in our guitar throws case. Throws it in our guitar case. Bag because full of money. Of, yeah, big big money. We don't, big, know, we, don't know, we don't know what's on here. Anyway, and then about five minutes later, the cops, two cops, are running down the street through our crowd. Radio. And we've stopped singing, and they've seen the guy run through it, so they just come on straight through, and we've stopped, and it's a beautiful moment of street theatre because we've stopped singing, the crowd is looking at the boat, at the guitar case, <laughs> and we're looking at the guitar case, and no one has said anything for like five minutes. So then I open it up, and it's <laughs> an entire... Bike suit, leather bike, jet, you know. Yeah. Oh, you know, not, a, not, not a leather one. Oh, sort of more of a. You've ruined the image for me. No, no, it was <laughs> leather for me, Jules. It was more of a. It was a more of a wetsuit sort of style. Wetsuit. You know, you could ride on your bike. No, Jules, you must have been on some weird drug, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it was a leather. Turns out there were yeah, some discrepancies as a story. Yeah, 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 it was some sort of. It was a leather type of jacket, <laughs> full <laughs> suit sort of thing. You like, you know, you'd ride a bike and a motorbike, and so what do you do? You got to put I it put on. it on. I put it on. Yeah. And then the crowd had seen that whole thing happen. Man goes through, drops bag, police. I put the jumpsuit on. Boom. We launch into a song. Oh. The, the police know. come back. Walking through. through and we say, and we hi, stop buddies. And wave. <laughs> yeah. and, and the they crowd walk on waiting. Through. And everybody's waiting. And then the police carry on. <laughs> and no, and everybody says a thing and we yeah. just keep singing. We're yeah. in the <laughs> outfit. The guys stop. And, <laughs> and that leather... I'm going to say it's leather jaws because it's... Well, it was more of a sort of a, a like black, but it was a more of a sort of a waterproofy sort of thing. Oh, yeah. So okay. Had leather bits in the elbow. Sounds like leather to me. Yeah, it sounds like that. <laughs> had leather yeah. in the elbow and the shoulders, Jules, yeah, you know, for yeah. extra protection. Anyway, um, that's still hanging in my wardrobe. Really? Yeah. yeah. 
Stolen property she's got. <laughs> <laughs> Crowd there must have thought that was a bit. Eh? They must have thought that that was an act someone run through. <laughs> um, amazing. So I'm going to take this in a slightly different direction now. We've sort of painted a little bit of a picture. I love when we get guests like you on, um, lived life so full of experience, full of happiness, full of challenges and full of success. I like asking big sort of overarching questions about their learned wisdom because um, it's, it's always incredible what you get back. So if you're open to it, I'd ask some bigger questions. Yep. Um, so what have you found are the key ingredients of success? You've, you've achieved great success. What, what Honesty. do you think? Honesty. That's all it is. Yep. To and be ne- honest. Never go back. You did a gig the other night and you made a mistake. Move on. Move on. You don't go back and say, oh, let's rehearse that bit and never make that mistake again. You know in your head what you did. Don't go back and try and rehearse it and make it better. Just move forward. And that then that makes you believe in yourself. If you never go back, you're always moving forward. And if you go back, that means you've taken a stumble in your belief of yourself moving forward. And that's was always been really important. Never write anything down. Then nobody oh, shit. Gets <laughs> <laughs> Here's the best one. Here's the best one. Never go on a program that you can be voted off. <laughs> okay. ah, yeah. This is really, if you want to be a successful, uh, you know, entertainer, celebrity of any sort, you have to have your absolute self-worth worked out at the very beginning of your life. And if you are worth a lot, your self-worth is worth a lot, you will not allow anyone who's not a professional to vote how good you are or not. Yeah. This is this is cheap TV. We've been asked to go on it. We said, we'll kill yeah. the... We'll kill, we, 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 the want, do you want us to go on the women's team or the men's team? The you first, su- what is that, su- you know, the survivor. survivor they yeah. did. And then they, we, we, our, our comeback was, look, in the first week, we probably would have killed one of the blokes. <laughs> <laughs> and on the thir- second week, we might have killed one of the girls because she'd be worrying about her makeup. <laughs> We said, you do not want to have the top twins on your show because we are too real, you know, we are too real. And I think what happens is that I've seen some of those programs. We don't watch them, but I've seen, I was flicking through the other day, you know, looking for the highlights for the Rugby World Cup. And um, there was a little moment on Celebrity Treasure Island, a little ad for it. And there was a bloke crying. And then later on, there was a woman crying. And I go, what's good about that? You've made that person feel really ugly and 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 Worthless. unsupported and everything. And in order to have entertainment on a TV program, let's change it. Treasure Island. Let's make it Treasure Island. There's twelve people. There's twelve chests buried on the island that have all got a million bucks in them. There you go. Let's yeah. make it real. Let's <laughs> Someone's make it making penal coladas in the corner. Let's get real. Let's yeah. have it so it's fun. Yeah. It's, what a, good, it's, a, it's a terrible idea. You're make killing you're killing Shay right now because there's two favourite things: are writing things down and celebrity <laughs> treasure. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> because they've sucked you in. They've sucked you into the drama. It seems yeah. like it. Yeah. 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 And, and, a dose well, of and you know what? Episode. I never remember who wins those things. I only ever remember who was the first one voted off because they were the least favourite person. But they might be a beautiful person. The very first time they had uh, Big Brother, it was an experiment in in, uh, Switzerland, I think it was, and the first guy that was ever, ever voted off that program went home and killed himself. And they said, let's make more of those. It's it's an amazing idea. That would have been a big telltale sign for me to say, let's not make any more of those. This is a, uh, you know... Yeah, it's mean, look, we we have to put people down in order to make sure... And they say it's entertainment. But in this day and age, young kids are watching those programs and they go, well, it seems it's okay that somebody can tell me I'm no good. You know, we don't want to give that message out to young people. We want to say to them, you're amazing. You're amazing. You can do anything. There needs to be way more positivity, you know, when you're dealing with young people. And that's just, well, I just think that we, we absolutely won't and never will and said absolutely no to that. We've been asked to go on to those programs and we said we will never go on to a show where you are voted off because you lose your self-worth. Mm. That is an incredibly in-depth answer. Yeah. I mean, but the, the honesty, the authenticity thing of success, I totally agree with it. Like yeah. it's, and it's why you have achieved the levels you have. My next question was about happiness and it might have the same answer. Like what, are, what have you found 
makes you happy? What are the keys? You need for to your do happiness? the things that you that make you smile, things that make you feel good inside. You know, but, and for me, fly fishing, that's my thing. I go out into the wild. I can be out there on my own. I'm in the river. I'm waiting for that you know beautiful trout to come by, and um and I have a policy of catch and release. So the fish that I catch are sustainable so that the good breeding stock is there for the next generation. And I think everybody who has something that they... You, if you ask anybody, they'll say, oh, I love this. I love doing this. I have this. a passion. Yeah. Absolute passion. My passion is horse riding. I just adore it. And if, I, if you don't have a passion in your life, you actually, you actually can't find your happiness because you're actually maybe might trying, to help, might trying to make everybody else happy. But if you if you aren't happy in your own self, if you haven't thing, found the thing that makes your heart happy, that makes you glow about something, then basically uh, you don't you don't understand how it feels for other people to be happy. So I think you know to find your passion is absolutely more most important. It's better than more than you know what do I want to do for a living? What do I want to achieve in my life? But what is my passion? If you find that first, you can go anywhere. If I get a chance. Like in a, like today, you know, the last few days has been hectic, full on, you know, writing, you know, writing about, well, talking about writing the book and radio interviews and podcasts and TV and everything. And I know that we can get through that because we both have a passion. And that passion is what keeps you strong. My passion is the horse and Linda's passion is the fish, you know. <laughs> yeah. And so, and so you have to have something. You have to have something, something within your heart that makes you feel passionate and that brings you joy allow you to give other people happiness i love it my next question is about health and feel free to give this as much or as little detail as you want but it's it's sort of well documented your personal journeys with yeah. cancer i was wondering if you could tell us what your cancer battles have changed about your perspective on life okay yeah. the first thing that we have done for our cancer a journey is that we never call it a battle because then we want to change the way people talk about cancer. And you that it means you're at war with your own self. You know, if you Google battle, it's about fighting. It's mm. about two things coming together to, to have a go at each other. And so we never think of it as a battle. We think we are living our life as best we can with our health issues. And so that is really important to us. That it it's not a battle. We don't want to fight with ourselves about being a bit crook. I'm, I'm, you know, um, only a couple of years into my breast cancer. Um, I got neuropathy from the chemo. Uh, and it's a thing called peripheral neuropathy, which is um, all your nerve endings um, in your, either your feet or your hands or both are damaged by the chemo. And so my feet are numb and they're every now and then, you know, probably eight t t to ten hours of the day, it feels like I'm standing on, you know, 100 needles. So it's constant pain and um, dealing with that and um, you know and I've, I've had moments where I have fallen because of my neuropathy and then I knock myself out you know because I don't put my hands out because there's no message to say that I'm falling and everything like that but there was a that was a terrible thing I ended up in hospital because I got concussion and everything but there was a joyous moment right in that where my beautiful little hunting dog my Labrador dream she came and found me and she licked my face to wake me up and then she went around behind me and put her nose and her head underneath my neck and supported me until my wife found me wow. and i was thinking there is joy even when i have fallen over yeah. you know because um you, when you're living with a health issue every day it's you know it's exhausting it's exhausting. Yeah, it is pretty exhausting. Quite weird. And it, for a long time there, it was a bit scary to try and think that we were maybe pushing to go, come back and do some gigs. Because when you're feeling unwell, it's pretty, it's, you feel a bit vulnerable in some ways. And uh, Linda, Linda's, you know, she's a, you know, she's a, just a baby cancer person. <laughs> yeah. um, and um, I've, I've lived with my cancer now for 20 years. Mm. And I'm really joyous about the fact that I'm a survivor, that I've got been through this, you know. I'm kind of staunch. And I work really hard. Um, I work on the farm every day. I make sure I climb. There's this really huge hill on my property. I climb that hill every day so that I'm really strong and fit. 
And I just think that if you sit on the couch and, you know, wait to die, then you probably will. But I make myself go out and I work and work and work until I'm sweating. And I just think that's good for my body. And I play with horses and I work with horses a lot. Um, and um, there's something really magic about that. And that's what keeps me... Um, the only time that I forget I have cancer is when I'm on a horse. Yeah. Because I now am communicating with another sentient being that has feelings too. And that's really important to me. And so um, it sounds like a, a really big picture. And in some ways it is. Because if I am not there, if I'm not in the moment with that horse, I could be killed. It's a dangerous sport. Mm. Um, and so if I'm not with that horse and I'm not communicating with that horse in the way that I want to, it won't feel of me. I feel for it and it feels back to me. And if I can't feel that, I know I need to do something to try and get that horse to be with me. Because he, he, people say to me, what is a horse thinking? What's he thinking most of the time? And I say to them, he's thinking that he tastes good because <laughs> he's an animal of flight. So he doesn't just, he doesn't stop and fight. He leaves. He wants to go. He wants to flee. And so when I'm on him, I want him to think, hey, I'm a bit scared. What are we going to do? I want him to bend and look at me and say, what are we going to do? And so I've been really lucky that I've been able to train with that, with that style of horsemanship. It's called vaquero, and it's an old Spanish way of riding. And I've studied that forever and ever and ever for about maybe nearly 35 years. And I just think that, that I've actually used that a lot when we've been performing, how to connect with people as if I, would, if I was connecting with a horse. Because sometimes, sometimes your audience is a bit scared. And if you want to go out and play with an audience, the first thing what they want to do is to be an animal of flight as well. <laughs> so you kind of have to know how far to push and to look after something. So I think my, 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 my health has been helped tremendously by understanding how another animal feels yeah. and how you can connect with that. So I think if people are listening and who are horsey people will understand that, yeah, there's... There's, the things can go terribly pear-shaped if you don't know what you're doing with a horse. It's such an inspirational outlook from both of mm -hmm. you and, <clears throat> and fascinating. And thank you for sharing that. Um, so optimistic and uplifting like everything you've done through your careers. Um, does it get frustrating? And I know that we're talking about the book and, you know, this is in there. And uh, I saw the Sunday program you did, which was really well done. Like the yeah. tone of it was, was, was so emotional and emotionally charged and well done. But does it frustrate you always having to talk about the health side of things? No, no, really. not really. Because, our, you know, as our mum said, you know, tell the truth faster. It'll get you out of, of trouble life. quicker. It's that, that line. We've always remembered that from our young days. Yeah. And I think, you know, um, if somebody asks you a question, we, we just answer it. Yeah. You know, that's easy. As, as, what is frustrating is, um, is having to deal with, um, you know, we've both got cancer. We're both still going through treatment. Um, and those treatments, you know, are drug, mostly from drug companies. Um, they're the only thing that they offer you. You know, there's only chemo or radiation or drugs that are offered for cancer. Um, and in and, and the sense of the health, you know, thing, there are other things out there that are people, are, are, you know, doing plant-based um, drugs. There are people who are using, you know, cannabis oil and all that kind of stuff. Or cannabis based whatever is right for you yeah if you think it's right for you just do it it's really so, important that you, know, you understand that the side effects of having cancer is what we're dealing with mm. quite a lot you know so i'm dealing with neuropathy which has not you know which ha which was caused by the treatment <laughs> it was trying to fix my cancer Can't, we've, we've you know? both never been never been sick with cancer we've which never is really, really strange yeah, we've only yeah, ever been right. sick from chemo yeah. uh, i get a bit sick now i have to have uh, two injections every four weeks in my butt, one on each side. I never look forward to it. I must. Have, I always think to myself, I must have done something terrible in a little past life to have this happen <laughs> now. But um, what it does is it, it, it finds my estrogen, which my cancer feeds on, and it appealed to my farming sensibilities, which is if you don't let something eat for a long time, it will eventually die. Or if you don't feed it, it will eventually die. And that's what it's doing. It's a new kind of uh, thing that they've come away from, away from chemo. And so I'm trialling that. I have two injections every four weeks and a tablet that helps the injection, the stuff that's in the injection, find my estrogen, right? And I think someone was really smart to find that. But I also think they're 
a real dumbass coming up with how you it's administered. A pill would have been good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I'll just I'll just say you're looking great. Like yeah. you're looking and sounding great. Like I, I feel so honoured that you're able to come and talk yeah. to us because there's so and much And I, I really on. wanted to thank the Italians because they made, they made the softest saddle, which might, means I can ride my horse. You go. <laughs> I'm, I can ride my horse because I have a really soft saddle. I hate now. to break to you, we don't have a huge Italian audience. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure we'll Most get Most women soon. that I know are usually looking for or, or talking about the Italian stallion. Mm-hmm. But Jules, yeah. she's talking about an Italian saddle. <laughs> <laughs> I think that might be a lesbian thing, Jules. <laughs> right, I'm going to pull us out of cancer chat. I want to um, talk about one passage of the book, which I, I need to hear the full story of, and it's when you first got um, Arani, am I saying that right? Yeah. Arani, your manager on yep. board, and she organised the first gig, <laughs> and it was a, a tour cow uh, on the Bombay Hills, uh, yep. south of the Bombay Hills, yep. but you didn't know it was a mongrel mob headquarters can you well, paint the picture and yeah sort of we we knew that there was a um, um one of the bikey gangs was out that way and um and but we didn't tell arani because she wanted to be our manager you know we well we went to her and said we'd like you to be our manager she had you know been working for greenpeace for a long time she was part of the team that you know turned the antarctic into a you know a national park basically so we thought she's a bit of a shake and remover, you know. Yeah. She's 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 got the right idea and the right passion, and so we asked her if she'd look, you know, like to do some work for us, you know, because we were taking the phone calls, you know, people trying to book us, and we're going, oh no. So I was, and I'd say, Jules, people up the road, yeah, want us to do a gig at the pub and stuff. We have to write it down, remember it, and it was getting a bit too much, you know. So we asked her, but um, so, and then Jules and I had gone out to the pub to drop off some posters because we agreed that we would do the. But she said, how do I know? Where, where am I going to get a venue? And we said, look on the yellow pages. <laughs> so somehow she opened the yellow pages and it said the two account pub. <laughs> you know? yeah. And then so we, we, go, we had some po- standard posters, you know, that we could write on, you know. So we took some out and um, we walked into the pub and, um, and Nana Tui was there. Now, we didn't know Nana Tui be- before this, but we walked in that pub and Nana Tui looked at us and she said, you're the twinnies from the TV, aren't you? And we go, yes, we are. And then so we had a beer with Nana Tui and then we put our posters up and then we headed off. And then, you know, about a week later, we came to do the gig. And um, it was Arani's first gig and she sat, <laughs> sat at the door, you know, and she was going to charge $5. It was $5 in those days to come and see And there was the a doctors. pool table right in the middle of the front of the stage and they, mm. we said, can we move that? And they said, no, boys won't wanna, might want to play <laughs> right in the middle, right slap bang in the middle of the, you know, in front of the stage. But it was classic because when, when Arani was sitting there and nobody had played at this pub for a long time. <laughs> it had been like a year and a, over two years or something before that. <laughs> And and was a, and there was some you know apparently the um, you know one of the um, one of the gangs you know it was their drinking hole you know I'm not going to say which gang it was you know you have to read the book I think it was in the book but anyway it was a bit of a drinking hole for them and stuff like that and um, but the management of the pub said yeah let's get the top ones up you know. And so we had people, people started coming. Arriving. We had farmers from around the you know, district too, you know. So, yeah. you know, farmers started when their wives started coming in and stuff like that, and and they were all paying their money and stuff like that. And there were some boys came in, and Don and uh, uh, Rani said, you know, it's five dollars, and they go, what do you mean, it's five dollars? We just come here to have a drink and play some pool, and she said, oh, the top twins are playing, and they just walked straight through. They said, nah not paying to come in we've been here coming in forever you know and then um we so we started singing we you know we started you know, they boys played a few games of pool and they sort of shifted it out to the side for a bit we started singing and then a tui got up we started with a maori welcome song because we, you know, we used to do that when we'd start and then a tui got up on the floor and started you know singing and dancing you know like you know in a way that said these are my twenties, and they have to be respected. It was a moment that we felt so mm. amazing about, you know, that she had Acknowled- done that. She had sort she, of acknowledged us, you yeah. know, about being there and stuff like that. And then slowly, as the night went on, more people started arriving and things like that, and da 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 da. And then more people arrived who wouldn't pay and all that kind of stuff. And then the the, the big boss of the gang arrived, 
and he, came, he went and got a jug of beer and he sat down at one of the trestle tables and he had his jug of beer and nobody else sat with him and he just sat there. He had a like, cobweb yeah, tattooed on, on his neck. Yeah, <laughs> on, on neck and everything. <laughs> yeah the <laughs> man, he's yeah. the man. <laughs> and, um, and everybody sort of looked at him and, stuff like that, and we were singing away and stuff like that. And then we had a great night, you know, and everybody had a great night. And then at the end of that night, all the boys who hadn't paid came up and gave Arani their money. Really? And then the big boy, who was sitting there with his one jug, when I looked out and we'd done our yodel, we were singing an old country yodel, there's like tears streaming down his face, you know? And I'm thinking, what's going on there? Anyway, at the end of the night, we ended up at the bar. Nana Tui was there. The, the gang boss was there, and he just told us that, you know, he just got out of prison, and um, and he told us his story, and he, he cried, and we all cried, and I was thinking, this is amazing, this is amazing, this, and for Arani, it was the most traumatic experience yeah. of her life, <laughs> because she was supposed to be, you know, the top twins manager, making money, and she couldn't get anybody to, to you know, pay to get, come in and stuff, but from that moment on, she realised that the top twins could play anywhere in New Zealand. Yeah. Is that the power of music or is that the power of relatability? It's the power of the top twins <laughs> is what yeah. it is because we understood. And as a performer, if you're playing, if you're walking into a venue and you know that you have to know the venue, you have to know the clients, the, the people that are going to come, your audience, you have to know them. And if there are people who are in the audience that you don't know, you have to make sure that by the end of that show, you know exactly who you're dealing with. And that that's what we had. I don't we know. Uh, can bring them with us. Yeah. We can reach out and somehow bring them with us. We don't, we actually, you know, some of the times we used to say, we don't know what the magic is, so let's not question it. Mm. It seemed to be working. But there was something that we were doing in our younger years that meant at the end of the night, that whole crowd was with us. And we, did, we didn't question it. We just said, whatever we're doing is working. And we still didn't have a, we still sometimes don't have a clue why it's working, but it's because it's the power of two. It's the power of two. And the other thing too was, if we hadn't gone out there the week before, if we didn't do our mm. due di diligence, we would never have met Nana Tui. And yeah. when you're an auntie, you're pretty big, but when you're a Nana, you're even bigger. <laughs> <laughs> and we know and that. Like we grew, up, we grew up in Huntley, you know. Yeah. We, 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 we had the joy of being around a Mora community f for a long time in our lives. And, you know, there were some people in New Zealand who are white who have still never been onto a marae. And so, you know, there were, there were, for us, it was no big deal. It just seemed like it was, our life has been like that. We've been surrounded by Maori people for such a long time. We were part of, the, of a community that, you know, slept at best in point many nights. We were, there were, there were uh, a huge amount of Maori women who identified it as lesbian. So that, that, we've been a part of this whole life. That's, we're all, we're all, we, all, we all cut when we bleed. Mm. And you know when we when we finally we all bleed when we cut yours, we all run the other way. <laughs> <laughs> all right, then. T t <laughs> tell tell me very quickly picky. when you were at the the Tuakau pub, were you still running the handbag out of the crowd? No, we were just, we were just as the top twins. Oh, we didn't okay. have the characters at that point. But did we you were just being ourselves? And then we were singing, singing old country tunes. Yeah, we and that, that 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 big head honcho boy with his cobweb tattooed neck, his his mother and father. Had, they loved country music, and he had remembered that. And when we sang that song, somehow something just happened to him. Triggered and he was just, something in He him, just yeah. made tears roll down his cheeks. And then we, when we spoke to him for quite some time, he'd had a terrible childhood. You know, he just had, had the worst life. And we were, we were, when we wrote our book, we realised we had the most perfect childhood. We had everything that we wanted, yeah. and we had a pony, and, and we, we had, had mum and dad. And we and had each other all that time. You know, when I say the pair of two, you know, I mean, this, it's two beers. Isn't it? Mm. Okay. Well, if you change that, you know, one beer, one beer podcast, it's got no power, has it? <laughs> it's got no, because there's nobody to talk to. Yeah. Shay's you know. always threatening to go solo, but <laughs> yeah. it wouldn't so, work. Yeah. It wouldn't work. Well, I don't know. No, because he doesn't drink beer anymore. Just yeah. have to be called, it would have to just be called. One. Just be one. Then yeah. they'd think you were telephone. They were telephone company and never talk oh, to you. That's really good. <laughs> So onto it. I, look, I, 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 I tried to get a little cue in there, but I've heard an anecdote about a, a handbag in the crowd. 
a, a shtick you used to do overseas, oh, yeah, we did, maybe. Yeah. When you, if, no, we've you done j- that millions of times in New Zealand. We, Linda would t- steal a lady's handbag and go through it. Yeah, and, and let me most... tell you, a lady's handbag is her castle. Yeah. yeah. You know, don't ever underestimate the power of a woman mm. that has had her handbag <laughs> stolen in a show. <laughs> I can remember um, it was in, where was that? It was down Te Aumutu Way or something. It was down that way. Te Kawiti. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, it was in the local hall. I walked out, or I actually used to jump off stage <laughs> as Camp Mother. No, that was the Giggums. Giggums yeah. I used to I'd jump off stage and I'd grab, on the way back, I'd be chatting away to people and stuff. I, on the way out, I'd be looking for a handbag that was available. And then on the way back, when the people were looking at the for, forward, I'd, under the seat, grab the bag and boom, I'd be on stage. And I was walking down the aisle of the hallway and I'd seen the bag on the way out grabbed the bag, shoved it over my arm and was nearly at the stage when the woman did I, it was almost like a, a French tackle. <laughs> flying tackle. A flying tackle on a Frenchman <laughs> from an all black. It was a flying tackle and she absolutely, round the you know, waist, took me down in the, in the aisle and I was, I turned around and I was trying to get her off and I was saying, I was saying, just go with it, all right? We're going to get you up to get the bag back. You'll get your bag back. Everything will be all right. Well, she didn't want to, she wanted that bag right there and then. And in the end, I had to beat her off with her own handbag. <laughs> so it was quietly. But, um, and then I got, a scram- managed to scramble up. Jules grabbed me and the lady was left, you know, there and stuff like that. And then I said, come on up. It's just your handbag. I said, come on up. So then she had to come up, you know. And then what happened was I opened that handbag up. And there must have been something like about, I don't know, five or $6,000 in cash <laughs> in the bag. Wow. And I'm going, either she's a drug dealer yeah, <laughs> or something, you know, is major in there. And what happened was she had a, a little shop and she had the takings. Uh, it was five, uh, seven, from, five, Friday, Friday yeah, night, yeah. Friday, Friday night gag. They'd put all the money in a handbag and come straight yeah. to the show. And so she had all the cash <laughs> in the bag. Yeah. But, you know, that cash meant everything to her and she thought we were stealing it. And you know? we did that gig lots. One time yeah. we did it one in Australia. This was funny. Oh, it could only happen in Australia, actually. There was a duffel bag. Linda brought a duffel bag up. It gets up there and we always looked in the bag and Linda would go, oh, shit, you know, she's seen something weird. sort of. And every time we did that, it was part of the gag. And then, so, and then she'd pull something out that was funny. And uh, it was I something look, always funny. I opened the duffel bag and looked in, and I did make that funny <laughs> look at Jules, yeah. and it was for real. Yeah. I'm going, because this is weird. What was in that bag was a vibrator <laughs> and an orange. Yeah, that's it. Like it wasn't a vibrator, Jules, it was a really big dildo. Yeah, yeah. Let's face it. <laughs> anyway, so Linda pulls both of them out, because I knew she would, right, when she realised something terrible wasn't there. So she's holding this ginormous dildo and an orange and she says quietly to the crowd okay there's something i really want to know here what is the orange for <laughs> <laughs> and everyone lost the plot and then i thought no one's going to claim this bag we're going to say whose bag is it because we'd say come down and get it and we'd give them a cd it was just a way of us giving them a cd to put in their bag but it was we would steal things moment. out of the bag while nobody knew we were stealing things yeah. we'd have their I'd take keys. credit cards no way someone claiming the duffel bag yeah. Yeah. with a no, big deal no, in it no but in australia we go whose bag is this and the lady goes it's mine <laughs> really proud of everything you know that's in the bag it's orange and I do it <laughs> just, really weird shit <laughs> just begs the question what why take it to a show i don't know hey I don't know. Know. People she must have been on her way somewhere with a dildo and an orange. Yeah. yeah. Did you, know, you ever get to the bottom of what the orange was, she was for? Pick someone up at the show and go on home. With <laughs> <laughs> so, would you like some supper and a dildo? <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, no big deal. But oh, it was good. a very funny night. It's good because you know we always turned these things into an advantage. And while Linda was mucking around, she'd hand things to me, and I'd be give them back and everything. But we always managed to steal. Someone's. We. I would. I'd have a little my you know, skirt and the ginghams because they were the country country uh, characters that we played. And I put there. Put a gold card there in a the in my, card, in my um, credit card and, a, and the keys and to the keys, their car. Right? Usually would be in. And the, then we take money out of their wallet and I put it in my pocket. Right. And so when they came up, we gave them their money back for the show, so they get them for free. But it was their money that we'd taken <laughs> out of their wallet. <laughs> and then we'd send them back. And then we and then just while they were getting down off the stage or something, we went back and we said, "How? Hang on a minute." Hang on a minute. He said, was that your card too? Your gold, gold card? Give him the credit the gold. card. And, and then, then finally he would say, oh, and by the way, you've won a hold and it's t- parked outside and that's the keys <laughs> to their car. So it was God. brilliant. And it was, almost every time you'd find keys, 
a sum of money and a credit card. Brilliant. So and a dildo. Yeah, yeah a dildo every, every, every now and then. Every now and then. Just rocket lucky. So good. Such <laughs> glory days. Like the retelling of it. So much fun. Um, we've mentioned Ken and Ken and the Gingham Twins. I'm keen to hear about Camp Mother and Camp Leader because maybe probably your most famous characters. They're, they're, they're pretty are. famous. Yeah, uh, yeah. And my childhood, Camp Mother, Camp Leader were everywhere. Like top twins, Camp Mother, Camp Leader. Yeah. When you came up with those characters, do you know instinctively that you've got something? Like, do, did you know that, shit, this is... We came up with those characters because it had been a terrible summer <laughs> and we wanted to go camping. And we thought, what we'll do is we'll do a stage, stage show and we will guarantee perfect weather. Because it was in the... In the in the, um, in the theater, the, the, the theater was it was down at the waterfront years ago when and the we turned the whole theater. stage into a camping ground, and all the people who were in the show were the campers. And we had and you, and you could buy a hamper, so you, we arrived and you got a hamper and you sat down and there was cushions and pillows and all sorts of things. It was like you were having a picnic at the camping grounds, and we drove our bambina into the camping grounds, and the first time we did the show, mum, my camp mother, she'd pop out of the roof of the we bambina, had a, we had a, you know, you know, little. little Pull Look, back sunroof and the yeah. bambina. So she popped her, popped her head out. I was driving the car as camp leader. I mean, that was dangerous in itself, having camp leader <laughs> drive because she's pretty erratic most of the time. And we come flying in, slam the brakes on. Camp mother pulls herself up the top and goes, hello, campers, you know, at the time there, and then puts her hand down the thing. And I slammed the door shut right on her hand. So oh, I slammed sh- camp mother's door shut in the bambina. Thank God it was a bambina. What happened was that, you know, them off. I, I was <laughs> taking them all in because I was the camp mother of everything. I was taking the, the crowd in and everything like that. I had a handbag on this side, on the on my left side. This hand was holding the <laughs> other side and camp leader got out, yeah. shut the door and my whole hand got yeah. slammed in the door. Yeah. Oh, so this is the start. first time we've ever done camp mother and camp leader. Now, if it had been a, you know, it had been a Commodore, I probably would have lost my fingers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was a Bambina, so yeah. it didn't close that tight. I mean, I could feel, you know, the bottom part of my fingers starting to pulse and swell. And then Jules finally realised and Open opened the door. the door up and I got my hand out and stuff. But I carried on as if nothing had happened, because that's what you do. Mum's, mum said, never let the audience know that you've made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and so we carried on. And so that was the first time we did Camp Mother and Camp Leader. And we had an absolute ball. And what happened was that Jules, halfway through the show, got very ill. Real, for real. I got food poisoning. And so halfway through this live show, Jules says to me, she's sing, playing the guitar, and she says, I think I'm going to be sick. I think I'm going to vomit. And then so I was thinking, oh, no. And then she was getting terrible, looking green and everything. So I ran and got a chair. And I put Camp Leader in it on the main stage, on the front of the, everybody. And, and I said, Camp Leader's been a little bit suck lately. Like There's been a bug going camp, around the camp camping ground. ground. And I'm just going to sit it down for a bit. And, and everyone then, thought it was part of the show. Yeah. Well, this is, your, then, this is the genius of your ad-libbing, I guess, yeah, is yeah. that it was believable. Yeah, and then yeah, finally... I thought it was part of the show. Yeah, finally, Jules thinks that she is going to vomit. And then, um, so she runs off the stage, you know, like, and a, a friend of ours who was actually doing some... Um, harmonies with us, and she was playing drums on the night. She had gone off with Camp Leader, and she'd run off and got a bucket. She found a bucket out the back, <laughs> a mop bucket. So Camp Leader is spewing into the bucket on the side of stage. And she's yelling back to Camp Mother, Carrot, the carrots and the wheat corns coming up now. Camp are, you st- <laughs> are you still mic'd up and everything? Yeah, like, everything. Oh, it's brilliant. all, it's all Everything beautiful. is happening in real life, right? And they said, of course, people always get stomach bugs at the camping ground. So and be- then I asked, went out, <laughs> Camp Mother is asking, is there anybody h- here tonight in the audience been feeling a unwell. little bit unwell. And a woman puts her hand up. She says, yes, I've been terribly unwell. And I said, you might be a carrier. You'll have to come <laughs> up on stage and be isolated. So we bring her up and put her in a chair in the corner so she can't spread the bug. So she she's there for the whole of the time. Show. And Amazing. then we gave her all sorts of things. We gave her a seat. Because when you get people up on stage... You look after them. You look after them. Yeah. And we always gave them a present. It was yeah. always a CD or... A, or something, you know, or a T-shirt or whatever we had, you know, as merchandise. We'd give them something at the end and say, thank you for being part of the show sort of thing. But she was over there, a camp leader who was now really ill, kept puking, you know, running on, not <laughs> puking. And the whole, and it was being reviewed. It was the first, oh. you know, of Camp camp Mother, Camping Out, the show was called. And then, so the, the next day, there is this review that is a rave review. It's brilliant. What an amazing idea about having a bug in the <laughs> camping ground and da-da-da-da-da. And then the second night, of course, you know, we, and we sold out. We'd already sold <coughs> out. 
Uh, Jules was, no, was oh, better. It was fine. It was much better. Did you have to, did and you have so to play the it next again? night, there was no, no bug, there was no puking, and people who'd read the critique. <laughs> going, what the hell? What? Give me my money back. <laughs> this is weird. Where's the bug? So, it, it, so it, this ties into your mum's advice, right? If you make a mistake, yeah. make it bigger. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like that. Yeah, we that. did. <laughs> yeah, it was incredible. And at the end of it, honestly, I was so ill. I got tetany. You know what tetany is? It's when your when your hands go backwards. Yeah, go oh. and they, you, and they, and you, everything goes tight. And I and I had I hadn't been able to lie down. I wanted to lie down from the you know very moment I felt sick, and I hadn't been able to. And so, I just uh, at the end of the show, we all went off, came back on, did a bow, and I ran off stage and collapsed on the back of the stage and had got tetany. Just and they all thought they were going to have to take me to the hospital. And then I said, okay, I just need a, some water and breathe a little bit, and came right. But I was completely paralysed for a good ten <laughs> minutes after the show. It was like you know, but it's interesting how you just do these things along the way. You just you <laughs> make make it happen. It, it must be amazing now, years later. Like you've come up with this creation, Camp Mother, Camp Leader. You do this thing, but it just takes off and it just creates this incredible world of its yeah, own. She's my most my. I'm Camp Leader. This is Jules speaking, <laughs> and uh, so. Uh, I think that uh, out of all the characters, I love her because I have no idea she, where she's going to go. Mm. She's completely and utterly out of control. Do she's the little part of me that wants to be naughty all the time. <laughs> I was going to say, do you, yeah, because it's ad-libbed, I guess you don't know where you're going to go <laughs> yeah. on yeah. any given <laughs> on, evening, right? On, on several occasions, you know, we'd be getting ready in the dressing room. We were doing some big theatre show or something in in you know Christchurch or Dunedin or something, and we'd moved into the big theatres with all the characters, you know. So it was 1,200, 1,500 seated theatres that we were playing to. And we're getting ready, you know, backstage and what have you. And um, and we'd be standing by and then the announcement would say, ladies and gentlemen, can you please welcome on stage the Tocklands? Or, and camp mother and camp leader would walk out. And just before we went out, I was thinking, what's camp leader going to do tonight? What's she going to do, you know? And my job was to keep the show moving forward. Because camp mother is, I wouldn't call her bossy. But she's in charge. Hey, that's, that's my job, Stephen. Yeah, you're talking yeah. to me. Yeah, that's yeah. Stephen, and, yeah. I, and, I'm, and I, you and Your me are the same. Yeah. Yeah. I just make so it up as I go along. And the, yeah. the classic. These are just for show. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> There's a camp mother and a camp leader in everybody. You know, there's somebody's. Well, well you, you choose. You're either camp mother or you're a camp leader. You can't be both. And yeah, it's someone's sidekick. Every, you know, if you look at all the great comedians in the past, there was always two of them: Laurel and Hardy. You know, all those great comedians. There was two of them, and the one was the sidekick, and you got you got the laugh because the other one was an idiot, and mm. the other one was always more common wise were yeah. the best, you know, at yeah. that uh, whole thing of the two comedians, and I, and you I know, guess and, you know, and, and the two mothers, Ronnies, you know, they were yeah. brilliant that sidekick thing, you know, and yeah. I suppose in Camp Mother and Camp Leader that that when you look at that sidekick thing, I was always moving forward, and I my job was to bring Camp Leader with me because Camp Leader me. was always veering off, you know, mm. on some yeah. other weird little tangent. And it's <laughs> it's really it's a very it's a really fun character to play, because even I don't know what's going to happen. No. There was a great story in the book about Prince Charles then, who's now oh, yeah. King Charles, yeah. and staying in character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was really funny because I went out and I had this great line because I wanted to say we're so happy to have the Prince of Wales. And octopuses and other fish here with us tonight, <laughs> but no, they said don't do that. Oh, it'll be really, you know, you might get upset. Yeah, you know, when you do, sometimes you you might get it. You know, we're doing media and stuff like that, and there's a list of questions that you're not allowed to answer, mm. or there's things you're not allowed to say. We got a little note, a, le- a thing saying, you know, says you you cannot <coughs> do this in front of you know the then Prince Charles and Camilla, and stuff like that. And so, um, and I did have a brief moment just before we walked on stage. Is Camp Lady going to stay up on track? <laughs> <laughs> She's going to go. Yeah. Hey, well, just I'll sit up there. Just on interesting gags. What was Helen Clark's reaction when you said that she's not a lesbian but her haircut is? <laughs> she loved it. She loved it. We we were we were in London. We were over there on when I was at, we were playing in London. It was our birthday, and the APAC, um, you know, leaders meeting was on in London, and we get a call. We get to London. We get a call. It's Helen Clark. And she says to us, could I come and introduce you on stage tonight? We said, that'd be fantastic. But, you know, we're, we're, we're leaning to a very leftist kind of audience most of the time. So we were, and Helen was working for the UN by then. She was, you know. And Jacinda was in London. At, for the uh, APEC heavily, heavily pregnant and at the APEC meeting. So Helen Clark comes on 
and introduces us. It's like they're, 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 they're mostly New Zealanders who are at the show, all homesick New Zealanders come to see yeah. the Top Twins on their birthday. And Helen Clark comes out. So there's, so there's a, just an amazing uproar of you know excitement that Helen Clark is now introducing the Top Twins. She comes on and then, boom, out we come. And then at the very end of the night... At half time, I'm, though, there was a bit of a bit of a, you know, there was murmur m- murmur in the in the in mm. the audience what was going on and stuff like that. And there was guys came in with headphones and were checking the seats and everything like that. And they're going, "What's going on?" There's been a, there were people thinking there was a bomb scare or something, but no, it's it's Jacinda Ardern's security team, and she has turned up with, you know, her bow, to watch the second half of the Top Twins show. So Helen's introduced us now. Jacinda is actually watching the second half of the show, and then at the end of the night, all three of them, Jacinda's husband, her, and Helen Clark, all walk onto the stage with a birthday cake for a happy birthday. And sing happy birthday wow. to us. And we just said this: only yeah. New Zealand could yeah. an ex prime minister and a present prime minister come on stage and give hand you over a birthday present. Yeah, That's and it was a it was a magical moment. It was just something does, that happened. Um, does Jacinda still have your caravan? Yes, yeah, she does. She does, I think. Yes. Yeah. Tell yeah. us a story behind that. Oh, well, I advertised it on Trade Me. A tree had fallen through it. There was a hole in the middle of it. But it was a very old starlit caravan, probably built in 1956, I think it was. And I said, this would be a great project for someone because it's got all the right outlines. It was made of fiberglass. It was ahead of its time, I, I, fiberglass and aluminium. And I said, I put it on Trade Me for a dollar. I said, someone might like to do it up. But a tree has fallen, a big branch had fallen through it, smashed this fiberglass root. And Pause there, Jules, for a moment. Was it? Pause. We're going again. Nice. <laughs> so good. How good. <laughs> so good. <laughs> anyway, Cheers. anyway, so what happened was uh, these people had come down from up north who restored old caravans and had a look at it. And they said, if you had anyone else who wants to come and see it? I said, no, nah, I've had no interest, interest, interest in it whatsoever. So they, they came down and uh, I... Put it on trade me. Bidding started. They and they and they said who they were going to be. They said we're going to bid on it. You know, we definitely want it. It's cool. I said, oh, that's great. They start bidding. It's on for a dollar. They put like they go. They go. We're just going to wipe out the rest of the people who are going to try and buy this caravan. And go to fifty dollars, <laughs> right? And then someone else comes on and puts a hundred dollars on it. No, right? so they they said, well, shit, we really want that caravan. They decided because it was you know quite a quite a rare little thing. And so they then they go, oh no, well we'll get it now. We'll just go 150, and then boom, they came two hundred dollars, <laughs> boom, <laughs> until it gets to a thousand. Wow, a thousand dollars. And I wrote on the timeline. I said, this caravan is not roadworthy. It yeah. has a hole in the top. It's got a tree in it. Yeah. This is a restored. You know, this is to be restored or even just to yeah. get a pattern off. And then at the bottom, it's munted. Yeah, yeah, completely and utterly yeah. munted. Yeah. Just and, it then, guys. and then the person, <laughs> the person this. who's now, and so the people who had come to see it rang me and said, who's bidding on it? Are you guys bidding on it? To get uh, it yeah, they the thought old, we the were bidding on it. So I guarantee 100% that we're not bidding. Some other crazy shit is out there <laughs> putting some money on this and they really want it. And so they said, we could, we're not going to buy it. We're not going to go any further. So it went to 1200 and someone bought it. Next minute, there's a whole car load of MPs and Jacinda Ardern arrived <laughs> saying, we've come to look at our caravan. <laughs> <laughs> and then she was up to the caravan and I said, well, that's it there. It's got a bit of a hole and everything, but it's cute. She said, oh, it's lovely. We can restore that. It'll be amazing. And she goes up and opens the door, and the whole fucking door falls <laughs> off onto the ground. Well, <laughs> the whole thing had rusted off and fell to the ground. And the beautiful thing is that <laughs> Jacinda and all the MPs managed to lift it onto a trailer, trailer. Yep. and they got it, took it away. And then it was probably maybe a, a couple of years later, um, we did a... Um, exhibition in Huntley at the little coal mine museum called Six Strings in Politics and, and some, it was all they, about they put the it together things. all they the people put, at the museum, they, at the museum yeah they together. put they put this this museum piece together about the top ones because that was our hometown and um, while we were all waiting there to go in for their opening here comes a little caravan <laughs> pulled up right outside the museum and it was Jacinda it was beautifully restored with the caravan wow. fully restored and they, she parked it outside the museum for everybody to no see no one even knew who she was then but she yeah. she set it up to be her instead of having a home where people would come and see her on a, her electorate she, they would, she would make them a cup of coffee in the little caravan outside and it was place. fully restored wow. absolutely 19 you know retro and I said how much beautiful. did you spend on it she said, can't tell you that but it was it was eventually with my the money I spent it was 
initially a deposit on a house and now I can't buy a house. <laughs> so it costs quite a bit of money. We'll put, we'll put that thought. one in the only in New Zealand file. Yeah, yeah well. that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And what was really cool when we did our, our tribute show, um, when the, all the, we did a tribute show down in Auckland at the Civic and all these musicians played our songs and came on stage and helped raise money when we were both pretty sick. Um, she came on, she did a beautiful um, uh, video couldn't be there in person, but came over on the video on the big screen and said thanks very much to the caravan. Oh, oh brilliant. So cool. And I'll yeah. make sure I always keep it on the road for you. So it was a beautiful moment, uh, you know. We won't keep you much longer, but I do want to loop back to what you said at the top, which is when we, when we spoke about Chris Parker and you said, well, that's our job, leave the door open for those um, that sort of follow you. Yeah. And him and Tom Sainsbury, who's also been a guest on the show and another one who I know draws great inspiration from you, they played you in this show, yeah, right? Yeah, they did. Camp Auckland. Mother and Camp, Camp Leader. Camp Mother and Camp Leader. Yeah. Like, that is such a cool moment. They were really cool freaked yeah, out about it. Did they do a good job? Yeah. They were really freaked out. And we said, look, the great thing about being Camp Mother and Camp Leader is you can do anything you want and it'll work. As long as you're in those outfits, you'll be fine. The crowd will love you. And they did. They absolutely adored them. They did a quite a bit of twerking at the end. That right at the never end, done. The, uh, Chris Parker, because we... What we did was... Is that part of your original act? We the did. old twerking? <laughs> no, no, we never no, did. Just, just checking, just yeah. fact-checking. <laughs> classic thing is we loaned them our original Costumes. camp mother onesie and camp leader's dress and cardi. They were they were their original outfits that they were wearing, so they were in the real McCoy. Now, I'm about five foot four, and Chris Parker's probably six foot, some, at least six foot. Yeah. So when he put my jumpsuit on, <laughs> it came up, you know, it was just about like below his, his calf, you know, calf. Yeah. And when he did pull it up to sort of, you know, get it to look like it was over some boobies, um, there was sort of quite a big bulge in the Oh, middle. right. <laughs> Chris, like, Parker. Chris Parker picking yeah. some heat. It was yeah. camp, yeah, it was camp, camp mother with... With with balls, yeah. I suppose. You're going to say he had, a, um, he had a dildo and an orange under there. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then what happened was they, they had a lovely time, and and Tom Sainsbury was so beautiful. He was so gorgeous as camp leader, and because um, you know Tom's done some amazing things. His characters out there, are, you know, out there. But he was so beautiful and soft and everything like that. And, and Chris had his handbag, you know, tucked in and, his, and everything like that. And then he turned to the audience and did the most incredible twerk that we have seen in a long time. Mm. Yeah. And, of course, it wasn't a pretty sight. <laughs> <laughs> did they stay true to uh, we there, the top I twins? said, just go for it. Just do whatever you think is funny. And they, and they did, and it was amazing. And uh, I guess in some ways that was – and all the time we've ever been performers and we've been around other performers, that was a moment because there was some love in the room that night. And we were both pretty unwell, and we didn't know whether we were going to make it. They'd be there. It was, we're hoping that we we're going to be there. And um, and so to hear other artists sing our songs, that was just the most beautiful moment. Because people, they, they understand that we're comedic and that we have characters and everything. But the vehicle to get us through every single show has been all the songs that we've written. So the songs for, to us are, you know, really important. So when, when we, like we just finished another uh, radio interview and they are just playing Top Twin songs and talking about what those songs mean to us. So there's, we have many strings to our bow, but those songs are really important because they are the vehicle. Yeah, the car that make us that, that classic moment was, you know, at that tribute show. That was sort of, you know, we'd finished our chemo, um, you know, treatment and, and it was, um, you know, a hard time, you know, at the end of there when I discovered I had neuropathy as well. Um, and we we walked out, you know, we were like the Muppets, you know, in the in the, we were in the you know the oh, royal the old, box, the old you know, the old, the old yeah. Muppets, yeah. you know, looking out onto the show. Yeah, and, and yeah, yeah, I never remember their name. Yeah. Good, that's really yeah. good knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, guys. And then when all of those beautiful performers came out and sang our songs, it was it was a tribute. We really felt so loved and so humbled by it. You know, it was it was a magic moment. You know, and you need every now and then you need one of those in your life. You know. It, it's so cool you got to experience that in the room because there was so much love. Like in researching for this app and listening to interviews and reading what other people are saying, there's so much love for you guys out there across yeah. New Zealand. And you know because you've played, you've been up and down the country 20 times. I think you've said like yeah. playing to bloody every city and town in New Zealand. And you know everyone you know thanks us for what we've done for New Zealand, but we really need to thank New Zealand because they came with us. They came along for the ride. They came for the journey. It's so cool. <laughs> is I know that it's been a difficult 
few years with health and with COVID and things. Is there any thought to getting back and, yep. and doing some more stuff? Yep, we're going to try and see out this year, just m- making sure that the, the book is out there. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're not silly. We know that, you know, once you make something, you've got to get it out there. You have to do the hard yards and tell the people that, you know, we want you to buy it and check it out and have fun with us. Um, and then uh, the following year, uh, we're hoping that we'll be back uh, performing in April, March and April. Trying to, we're, we've got a goal. We've got a goal yeah. to do, you know, three gigs at the moment. We've planned for three gigs, you know, around March and April, and that's the goal. So that's what we're And now one for. of them is the Cavalcade, which is 800 horses travelling around Otago, and we, when all those people come in from coming from about six different directions. There's heavy wagons heavy coming wagons, in Heavy wagons, light wagons, people on horseback. Clydes everywhere. And they'll arrive, like that. and that night when they camp will be the entertainment for them. And that's kind of fun for me because I love a horse or two. Yeah. And then uh, we'll play the Wanaka AMP AMP show, show. which we've done many times. We've loved that show. Get there. Right on the shores. And then a writer's festival with the book. So that's what we're heading for. And we just, you never quite know how your life's going to be when you're living with cancer. As to you hope like hell that you can get through it. And, um, you know, um, I guess hopefully by the end of the year we'll be fit and ready to go. And, you know, things haven't worsened for both of us, but... You know, we'll just take it as it comes. You just live each day, you know, every day above ground's a good day. Absolutely. Um, just before I, I throw to Shay for, for any last words, um, thank you so much for coming in and sharing this time and the space with us. Like, I can't recommend enough, go and buy the book. If you've listened this far in the episode, go and buy the book. There's so, like, we've only scratched the surface. There's yeah. so much gold in there. You guys <laughs> have lived such full, entertaining, exciting lives. It's been so cool sort of running through some of the greatest hits with you. And, yeah, I just really appreciate you guys giving us your time. Yeah, it, I've been, I sat here in awe, really. This has been one of the most enjoyable episodes that we've done in, in 150 or so. Um, oh, it was 150 years, I thought it was. No, well, <laughs> <laughs> but you, you, yeah, yeah. you, you yeah. spoke about how Top Class was a magic moment, having having those songs played back and sung back for you. And this has been a magic moment, I think, for me and for us. Like, for over 40 years, even to entertain New Zealanders and... I, I guess my knowledge was really only the entertainment part, but not the social, political, cultural landscape that you've touched. Yeah. And you spoke about legacy, and it's wonderful that you have the, the book as a legacy and that your songs will live on as legacies, yeah. but also that we've been able to catch it, maybe just a little part of that legacy of, of New Zealand history, um, our own, on, yeah. on our little podcast. So thank you so much for for taking time out and sharing some time with us. Wish you well, all the very best. And here's to, yeah, you know, here's to the two beers because you have really made a, a difference. You've made a change in you know, how blokes think and how blokes can talk to each other and, and how you know, blokes and lesbians can get together and have a beer and, <laughs> and it's all good. Love it. Oh. Cheers. Thank you so much. Cheers, guys.